Hi, this is Claudia Phylos with the Center for Linux Studies, and we are here today with, um, with a wonderful uh, actor. He's a writer. He's an educator. Paula Mahoney, thank you for joining us today. Hello. Thanks for having me. Um, so, Paul, I just wanted to share a little bit about your biography before we get started. You are currently the artistic director of Temple Theatre, uh, with whom you've created Unmissable. It's an award-winning show, um, and you are also, uh, you've done stints with companies such as the Orange Tree Theatre, the Royal Shakespeare Company, and the English Touring Theatre, among many others. In 2011, you adapted three Greek tragedies to create the House of Atreus which was produced at the Barbican in London. Um, and with Rob Castell, you have just recently completed your first full-length musical, Olympia, also based on, based on Greek mythology. And among other things, uh, you have studied classics at Oxford University, where you twice won uh, the Cockwell Prize. Cockwell Prize. Cockwell Prize, yes. Sorry. Uh, and you were also awarded a, a scholarship in ancient history. So you have so much experience um, and expertise, and we're so excited to talk to you today about mythology and uh, about outreach, uh, mythology today and outreach. So thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you. And um, yeah, I, I suppose um, I, I want to start off by saying I, I probably have more questions than answers um, with all of this. And uh, I'm going to start off kind of very, in a very Socratic way by saying uh, probably what I've learned over the 12 years of, of working in professional theatre is that I, I don't necessarily know anything, um, but we're constantly trying to find answers and solve problems um, because sort of the joy of creating stuff is that it's such a practical, um, pr practical thing. We just want to find solutions that work. Um, and that's kind of a bit of what I want to talk about um, today. Um, and I also wanted to talk about what it was that um, inspired me to, inspired my love of classics and inspired me to bring that classics into pretty much all of the work that I do um, as well. So if you'll kind of forgive me, I will sort of start off by just sort of talking you through that, that process, which starts kind of quite early on, um, actually, with um, um, when I was just a young boy. Um, uh, the Osborne Book of Greek Myths um, was sort of the, the initial kind of um, inspiration for me. And in fact, um, to celebrate that, um, Sarah, I do have um, an image of that, um, uh, which I think perhaps some people can see now. Um, there it is. Fantastic. Yes, the, uh, the Illustrated Book of Greek Myths, which was something that I just loved when I was younger and really devoured all the stories. And I suppose it's the stories and the storytelling aspect um, that has kept with me in everything I've done um, in my studies and then since then in my work as well. And um, I think it's that storytelling urge that we share with the Greeks, who obviously kind of go all the way back to Homer, um, had that in abundance, um, that really sort of unites us with them now and makes it so electric and exciting that we continue to tell these um, stories. Um, I should also say as well that um, my old professor at Oxford uh, was uh, Chris Pelling, and he his his one bit of advice that I've always remembered. <laughs> I remember some other things as well, but um, one thing that he said to me that I've remembered and stuck with me is that if in doubt at any point when you're talking about classics, just talk about Homer, because it's probably relevant. Um, it didn't massively help me in my art and architecture paper, probably, at university, but um, it did kind of fit in with pretty much everything else. And so um, that's why I mentioned um, just on the, on the blurb about this talk about if anyone wanted to do any reading beforehand, reading Iliad Book 24, I thought a bit of an ask to ask everyone to read the whole Iliad in a week. Um, but Book 24... Um, because it was the Iliad, really, that was a, a huge inspiration for me uh, as a child. I was lucky enough to go to school where I could uh, study classics, and we, uh, and we read the Iliad in English. And it was reading it in English that then really inspired me to go on and study classics further um, and go to Oxford, where I could... It was sort of the one place, really, that I properly learn ancient Greek and read it in the original. So that was something that was very definitely a, a spur for me and to kind of connect with that, that sort of very first storytelling in Western literature. 
um, and it's something that has inspired me in the work that I've been doing ever since. And I remember um, when I applied to university, the prospectus, the first line of the prospectus, you know, sort of selling you classics, um, it said, uh, it started off, classicists can do anything, um, which I was always sort of very keen on the idea of. I mean, I can't really wire a plug, but I, I like the sentiment, if nothing else. Um, and uh, and it, I suppose it's the sheer range that we find uh, in classics. And I should also say at this point, I'm, you know, I'm not an academic and that my, my enthusiasm for the classics is really, you know, a love for the classics. And I have done some study, but there are large, large gaps. Um, but it's that it's the sheer breadth of of history, of fields of study, and how interconnected those fields all are, and how really interconnected we are still with with all of that in in so many ways. But be it sort of history in terms of plotting, you know, looking at the beginning of Herodotus and East v West and the ongoing saga um, of that and the re its relevance today, um, albeit sort of the literature that we have, the way that we tell stories, and indeed the the stories um, themselves. So I was very inspired to to learn um, ancient Greek, and uh, I, I will just sort of tell a very brief story about um, sort of the culmination of that was then sort of the, the day before my Homer exam, <laughs> I was still busy reading Book 24, which is why I sort of thought I'd, I'd ask everyone to read it now, because they can also feel the pain of last minute cramming. Um, and I remember being upstairs in the library, because they, they're so sadistic at Oxford that they have 24-hour libraries. Um, and I was there sort of frantically reading it in the Greek, and my friend was at the other end of the library, also frantically reading it in Greek, sort of, think, think, sort of feeling determined, like, we've come this far, we've got to get to the very end. Um, and we both reached the the point where um, Priam uh, supplicates uh, Achilles, asking for for Hector's body back, um, and has that just that beautiful passage where he's saying, "But you know, um, respect the gods and take pity on me, for I've done what no man's dared to do with my hands. I've touched the face of the man who's um, killed my sons." Um, and uh, and I remember it so vividly getting there, and um, I don't know whether it was sort of the fact that it was four o'clock in the morning and I had an exam the next day, or sort of the fact that I had about five cans of Red Bull by then, but it had such a, such an incredible effect on me, and I, I started crying at the library as I was reading the Al Ideo thing from South Um and uh, I just suddenly felt. I've, I've got to be with someone right now. And um, as I thought, I'm going to go and find my friend Darren, who lived, uh, well, not lived, sorry, it's not like he lived, who was at the other end of the library. It's been a long term. And um, it, it had just so happened that he had got to the exact same point as well at the exact same time. And he had had the same reaction for all the same reasons. And we ended up meeting halfway in the library we sort of both came to find each other and so then we ended up sort of hugging each other in a slightly sort of i'm not sure who was achilles who was Priam. neither of us felt like achilles at that time i think we both felt a lot more like priam and um and it was just absolutely wonderful this this opportunity to share something with with another human being and to me that's sort of part of what the essence of these these texts are they are so they are so human they are almost sort of superhuman um, and then to share it with someone felt so important, not to just be reading it alone as a text, but then actually to be sharing it with someone, sort of to, you know, I'm a big, big believer that plays, poems, they should all be, they should all be studied aloud, yeah. because that's, that's what they're intended for. Paul, you know what, it, I think that's such a moving story. I just want to pause for one second, because I mm. bet our community members have maybe a reaction to that, um, oh, sure. to your story. Is that okay? Of course, yeah, of course. Janet, I saw you nodding your head. The crying part, it, it is, we have done that many, many times when we were reading and uh, sharing. And uh, and we, la we laugh as well. It's not only crying, but yes, 
the emotions are always there when we are together sharing it. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's such a fundamental aspect of it, what, that urge for you to need to experience that with someone else, right? I mean, exactly. It, it's sort of that sense of, of community and just and shared humanity yes. um, that the yes. texts have in such huge abundance um, that, that just, it, it, it requires there to be more than one person. So is that is that part of what drove you to to be so focused on sharing these myths in performance? Definitely, it was it was just a real sense that they they're there to be performed. Right. They're there to be in, in in all the various ways, whether it's being sung or just read aloud or being performed in theatre. They are they are there to be performed. I just a little coda to that story as well as that um, <clears throat> bring up on the theme that you know yes, yes. can do anything. Yes, yeah. Um, I love but, that. Uh, That's a nice theme. I mean, all I say is, I mean, you know, you might expect me sort of, you know, as I work in the arts, I got very upset about reading this passage when I was in tears. But you know, but Darren went on to be an investment banker. Uh huh. Um, and you know, sort of, it sort of, there's this whole kind of wide range of things that people end up sort of doing who, who sort of have this this moment, and then we we are all, we are all moved by, by book twenty four in that way because it's yes. sort of part of being human, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, that that's the way, and yeah. So I was very very inspired by by my further reading to to then take these myths um, into into different places and and share them as much as possible with people. Because like I said I was very really lucky. I went to a school where I had access to to these myths, <clears throat> and but so many people don't. And I think it's a a huge sort of worry really um, for. For the classics community, I know mean, it's not sort of a, a problem that is particular to to the UK or to the US. I think it's you know sort of it's a it's a general thing. Actually, I was I was at a conference um, on Saturday in Cambridge about classics and communities, and they were talking about different ways of bringing classics um, to people as much as possible, providing um, more opportunities for learning the language in in state schools so that everyone has fair access to it. Um, and one of the uh, one of the speakers was from the Classical Association of Ireland, and he was actually saying that of all of the uh, the people taking the school leaving certificate um, in Ireland last year, I think it was 110 took Latin, and that was it. I think I, I think it was out of 50,000, um, which is obviously a worry. And, and years before, uh, there was just so much more of that, and. I mean, there are the, its own reasons for that as well, in terms of sort of the the Latin mass not happening and whatnot. But it is a worry that this is this is on the wane, and I think it's a it's also a worry that theatre has, and that's where I think they can kind of there's a lot of um, overlap with this in that um, I think theatre has a, a a job on its hand to to ensure that there is an audience for in the next generation. I think we're increasingly in a place where I mean it's, it's sort of anecdotal evidence really, but when I'm off, very often when I'm performing, you look out and um, there sort of tend to be people with sort of my amount of hair or or less mm -hmm. out there, um, mm -hmm. and there there aren't necessarily the younger there isn't necessarily the younger generation that's coming through that is is going to live theatre, mm. um, and so there's a real there's a real need again I think for us to take um, to take theatre to people rather than to expect people to come to theatre and that's mm -hmm. what I believe as well in terms of the outreach that I've been involved with in classics over the years is that you can't just expect people to to come to you necessarily that actually if they don't know what they're missing then then, then they don't know. Um, so so how do you take myths and theatre to people? How, how, how do you go about doing that? Well um, in a variety of different ways, some of them sort of probably slightly more traditional in terms of um, uh, with a colleague of mine called Richard Darborn, who's now a theatre producer. He and I set up a, uh, a theatre and education company called Living Learning. <clears throat> and one of our central aims was to increase students' awareness of the classical world in however sort of small a way that we possibly could. Mm -hmm. So we, we devised a show that um, went round to students um, between 9 and 11 years old 
called Telling Tall Stories that um, offered an introduction to the classical world, to the Greek world as it happened, with uh, two brothers, um, one of whom was called Euripides, who were very keen to tell stories and take students on a tour around Athens uh, in the 5th century. Um, <clears throat> and so with that, we would introduce them to some of the places they might see, and at times it was a bit sort of historically uh, elastic, I'd uh -huh. say. Some of those buildings may not have been there at the time, but, you know. <laughs> okay. um, you know, they, hopefully these students will find out in later years that sort of, oh, he was wrong when he said that, and then I'll get right, an angry right, email right. at some point. <laughs> um, but that'll be fine. Um, and, and then introducing um, just one of the things I found most effective in outreach a lot of the time is just the very, very simple things that are about our life that, that we share with people who live back then. The idea that you go to the market to buy food. Um, right. The idea that you have coins that have heads on them. On the back. Right. Um, and actually as well, sort of, which tied in very nicely in London a few years ago, the idea that they had the Olympic Games as well. Um, the sort of bigger things like that. And, and seeing that realization dawn on people, on, on younger sort of uh, kids like that, that actually <clears throat> there may be these two and a half thousand years, but all of a sudden that just collapses right. because we're still telling the same stories. We're still interested in the same things. That's so fascinating. Um, you know, Paul, you know, one of the things I think about is when I learned Baby Greek over 20 years ago, um, one of the storylines that they had was, it was a fictional story about this mm. farmer, Decapolis, and his life was very hard on the farm, but him and his child go to a festival, and they go and they get basically shish kebab, you know, meat on a stick, and I right. just, it's like, they're, they're, go, they're going to the, to the big game, you know? Um, exactly, exactly. It's those, it's those things that really bring it alive then, isn't it? That it's not, um, I think this is one of the things I sometimes worry about, that, um, that there is sometimes this idea that, that classics is is pretty dry um, right. and is all about sort of you know white lines and kind of things being very austere and rigid and I don't know I think maybe to some extent in the UK that's probably probably connected to the Victorian reception of of the of the Greeks and how we wanted it and I think you still see it in in museums a lot of the time um, sort of it's it's amazing how often I kind of go to you might go into a museum and it's, it doesn't seem very kind of alive uh, and exciting. Of course, that's partly because we might have you know scrubbed the life out of them and done whatever else. Um, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but um, but it, it's it was really lovely actually going to see the Defining Beauty exhibition that was on recently at the British Museum, and uh, and they had they had painted some of the pieces. Because they were originally painted, we know that these statues were in fact very vibrant. They weren't all. Right. Exactly, and I think it's such a it's such a wonderful thing for people to realise that actually <clears throat> these things won't happen in a sort of a, in a dusty, straight, um, rigid environment. Actually, it was it was really loose, and I think sort of the spirit of the Greeks that we want to get across is more like the Eleusinian mysteries, whatever was going on there. But right. you know, you can kind of imagine that it probably wasn't sort of um, sort of anything too sedate. Right, and it's right. that sort of that sense of um, the mysterious and the exciting and the sexy as well that the that classics has and that we want to kind of communicate more and more um, to people and and also kind of connected with in terms of like you know, bringing the myths to people and what we do is about not feeling that these things are preserved in aspic they're not museum pieces they are they're living breathing stories that that have been passed down from generation to generation, and actually we're sort of we're we're sort of still engaged in the oral tradition, although of course we write them down and you know, we have the Osborne Book of Greek Myths, um, but but we we write them down to tell them aloud as well, you know, most importantly, um, and that's kind of we're still sort of in that oral tradition of of passing down these stories and sharing them, but with that, I think that we should feel um, feel comfortable with the idea of of changing them and adapting them and not feeling that there's something absolutely kind of set in stone with it that mm -hmm. actually if there's one aspect of it that really appeals to us that we we take that aspect further and we lose possibly um, some other details this 
possibly sort of neatly brings me on to um, one of the shows that that I've uh, created with with some of my colleagues and <clears throat> which we've toured an awful lot, which is Unmythable, which you right. mentioned before, which is um, it's all of the Greek myths or trying to do all of the Greek myths in an hour, <laughs> um, which definitely and and behold, there is there is a poster um, that Sarah's oh, right. put up. I yes, think. thank you. Yes. Um, um, and so just to remind people, so you, you just came from the Edinburgh Festival, right? Where you I, I were... did, yes. Uh, we've been performing Edim uh, in Edinburgh uh, uh, across the month of August. Um, and, uh, yes, in fact, I can show you, I, I, have, a, I have a badge on Oh, hello, well, Lee. Um, that is a, sort of an official medal for anyone who sees the show. Right. Um, and, and, in fact, it's toured through over 80 theatres, I think, across the UK, Europe, and New Zealand. That That's right. Yes, um, and it, it's been really wonderful seeing how how connected people feel to these stories across the world. I mean, we've taken it to New Zealand, um, <clears throat> and I think one of the concerns they had um, when bringing the show, we were at the International Arts Festival there in Wellington, and they were sort of worried that maybe the tradition of you know, of, of Greek mythology is not so well. No, they, they study their own mythology within um, and tradition within uh, their schools. Um, and perhaps, whereas when we've done it in Europe, there tends to be possibly be a little, little bit more kind of awareness of it. They worry about that. But it was amazing how that barrier just completely fell away. We travelled 12,000 miles and instantly people connected with the show and to the, to the point where it, it was the only show in the whole festival which, which sold out. We sold out all 13 performances. Um, across two weeks. No, I've actually gotten to see a, a little video of it, actually, and it is mm. incredibly lively. When you talk about bringing these things kind of to life um, mm. and not having it be this kind of dusty experience, I mean, I think you've completely taken that to heart. But, you know, I know Sarah, um, who is here today, and she's displaying the images, so um, maybe she could just pop on in a second and share a little bit about what it was like to be in the audience. Oh, yes. She she had a chance to see the show. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, and uh, I have my badge. Oh, yay! <laughs> I am here. <laughs> You're in the club. Yep, yep. Um, yes, one. Uh, it was a great. It was a really great show. I really enjoyed it. Um, but one of the things I was noticing was um, that way you were connecting with the audience um, from the, right from the beginning. You know, inviting us to to cheer. And of course, we kind of know know how to do that, you know, with pantomime or something like that. We we cheered quietly the first time, and then much louder the next time, and then we were right in there. And also, you were addressing heroes who were supposedly sitting amongst the audience on different parts of the audience. So there were other unseen, as it were, characters who were supposedly amongst us. So we were part of that that heroic band. So you really brought us right in from the beginning. So oh, good. So, so Paul, just to give some more context, um, you know, I hope mm. you'll talk a little bit about it. This is a three-man show, and basically the premise is that uh, there are the Argonauts, right? It, the framing narrative is the Argonauts, and so then the the audience is sort of brought in to also be part of the Argonauts, and so that's why they're they're cheering on their heroes, right? That's right. So exactly, the Jason and the Argonauts is the the spine that we keep coming back to, and uh, and all of the audience make up the Argonauts, <clears throat> and we have Jason and his two assistants who are called Beta and Gamma, um, because, <laughs> because neither of them are alpha males. <laughs> and um, they, uh, they then, and then there's just, just the, the device that Sarah was alluding to there was that we, whenever we say the Argonauts, the, um, the audience has to kind of cheer and roar, because it's, it's up to them to help us sort of complete the mission, right. um, so that everyone can feel included. And then some people sort of just get named sort of very briefly, sort of, you know, oh, look, there's Narcissus, put the mirror down. That sort of thing, um, Oedipus, or we won't talk about that, um, <clears throat> etc. Um, so that's one way that we get through quite a few myths. But then also, um, we then sort of tackle other myths, sort of in in greater detail. If actually, Sarah, I think there are a couple more images from a oh, yeah. from an earlier production of um, Unmythable coming up. So um, here, here you can actually see um, that is very obviously on the left, Medea. Um, <laughs> And her father there on the right, um, <clears throat> and Medea 
became a, this, is, this is a Will Pynchon and Trolls Han Vincent who are two people who helped um, develop the show and uh, and Will is uh, American and he uh, he just he sort of we ended up with a sort of um, a slightly sort of aggressive cheerleader um, Medea who was pretty ruthless on her in her mission to get the quarterback uh -huh. um, I, 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 I've seen American films that's all I know about high school uh -huh. um, and um, and Aetes ended up being Marlon Brando, um, <laughs> and completely terrorising Jason. Um, basically, oh, so one of the things that we really enjoyed um, when revisiting these myths, and actually, I'd say to show you the um, there's a the next picture, Sarah, um, is this here? I think coming up in a second. Um, very shortly, you'll be seeing this is um, Demeter and Zeus having a disagreement um, about uh, the treatment of Persephone. Um, and of course, I mean, part of the, the nature of the show is that we all have to play about 25 different characters. Um, <clears throat> and one of the lovely things about it is that creating it as a group, um, that we wanted to involve the audience and that we wanted to create something that was a celebration of these stories and f a pretty faithful up to a point, I mean, up to you know, a fairly good point. And then we took whatever liberties we <clears throat> felt were necessary. Um, but it's amazing how much uh, the stories take on their own life once you get a group involved. Mm -hmm. um, because what, uh, That's interesting. What do you mean by the group there? Well, just that we, would, uh, we started off, um, we started working on it actually, we had a week's residency in a former Danish uh, mental asylum, and we Kate went there with um, with a load of books about Greek mythology, with the video of Jason and the Argonauts, um, sort of that classic um, film, and and then we all sort of went off and decided what myths we found most exciting, and what did we want to what did we want to to do with them, and it's I was the one who was sort of you know was the big Greek myth fan. I was like, come on, guys, let's do it. And I've got, you know, I've got a louder voice than the rest, so I kind of forced them all to get involved. Um, and they sort of took the stories, and what they found interesting might not have been the same thing that that I found interesting. Mm -hmm. So, if some of, for example, some of the things that we became quite interested about in the story of Odysseus was looking at it from a slightly unusual angle of, you know, we hear about this hero Odysseus. But what's it like being one of his men on the ship? Um, Who all die? They pretty pretty all, well, they all die, basically. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, is, so great. Which is a shame. So we actually sort of recast sort of that slightly. So we, we told the story of Odysseus through the eyes of, of, of one of the guys who had sort of had the misfortune of being there with him. And we kind of cheated by making him still alive um, <clears throat> to tell us. Um, but we were interested in sort of the the angle of looking at these myths afresh from the perspective of the defeated or the people who get forgotten along the way. And we had a, have a sort of a, a, a song. We, there are a number of songs in the show, actually. Uh, one of which, so we wanted to cover, for example, all of the different animals that Zeus turns into to, to meet women. Um, and so we kind of created a rap that, that fitted in with that, that we could kind of then cover about sort of 30 different myths in, wow. in two, two and a half minutes um, but then there was just it was sort of interesting to us we were reading the story of Heracles say and one of the one of the others in the rehearsal room said I mean just when it basically whenever things go wrong he just says you know he ends up killing his wife generally and then he just says he went mad and everyone goes <laughs> oh all right never mind you went mad <laughs> um but like next time and um and that sort of just how many people how much <clears throat> we sort of we termed it as how much collateral damage there is along the way in a lot of these stories, uh -huh. um, and so we wanted to. We were very aware that you know we were a group of, uh, of it's three male actors in the show doing these stories, and we were very keen to kind of address that as well. That there are a lot of people who get hurt so that people other people could become heroes. Um, mm. So we so we have a, a song called uh, called the women's song, which is sort of like a, a, a protest song, really. Um, sung by Pandora, uh, Hippolyta, and Helen, <clears throat> that is um, railing against the way that 
they've been written up and that they've been treated um, right. within these um, stories. So it's sort of, it's sort of, it, it's, we're really keen to, to look at these stories completely afresh and hopefully from different and slightly surprising angles um, to show that there is more than just, oh, it's more, more than just sort of just heroes and it's just about sort of you know, heroic men going out and doing things. Actually, there are, there are lots of different angles within this. <clears throat> and of course, as well, from, a, from a, a female actor point of view, aside from the idea of devising new shows based around mythology, the, you know, the Greek literature gives amazing opportunities for for um, for acting you know for, um, uh, roles far no. more far more than anything in the English canon really. Okay, so fascinating. Okay, I'd like to pause and just take a break and see if we mm. have some responses and questions from our community members. And I just want to um, also welcome our community members who are joining us from around the world. Several of them are actually one place today meeting because not only do we meet online, but we actually meet in person sometimes. So just introduce yourselves uh, before your question, guys, or comment. Everyone's being a little bit shy. Anyone have a thought or comment? Yeah, Jack. Uh, I, I've tried to get, uh, I'm Jack Vaughn in Houston, Texas, and I've, I've uh, tried to get our Alley Theater to uh, uh, look at uh, producing Euripides uh, so far without, uh, without much success. They just encouraged me to give them more money, and uh, maybe I'll eventually give them enough, but um what uh, what what why can't we get um, uh, Euripidean plays um, uh, such as uh, Medea or Hippolytus and Andromache with perhaps some um, education about the underlying myths that may have been taken for granted in the fifth century Athens uh, why can't we get them produced more? Hmm. So what's what's the challenge there, Paul? Um, yeah, I, th I think that is that is a challenge that people experience. I think sort of um, in a lot of places, as it happens right now, it's sort of it's quite an exciting time um, in in the UK in terms of the number of productions there have been, which is kind of really encouraging and hopefully that's something that maybe is going to be is going to carry on I hope it's not a flash in the pan but just in the last year we've had um well last probably about nine months but two Aris Dyers, a Bacchae, a Wasps, um, two Hecubas, um, Antigone, Electra and the Medea um, <clears throat> all happening in very very big very very big productions in fact the sort of the hottest ticket of the year so far has been the Aris Dyer that was done um, Oh, wow. At the Almeida and is now transferred, but I think. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I would just. Well, what's? I'm curious about that. What's driving that? Do you think? Um, it's it's a really good question. I don't quite know why there's been why we've gone sort of it's sort of feast or famine. It seems because you know there hasn't been much around for a while. It seems, but all of a sudden, it's very much um, the, the fashion mm. of the day. Um, I think that there are. A number of reasons. One is that they're great, um, <laughs> you know, um, and <clears throat> and they still have so much to communicate with us. Um, mm. And I mean, for example, one of the things I've been thinking about the moment is how uh, how relevant a production of Aeschylus's Suppliants would be right now in terms of what is going on in Europe and in Greece in particular with with the refugee crisis. How right. sort of this. Play, you know, play written in whatever it was about four six eight BC, wasn't it? Um, it I mean, it could not be <laughs> more timely. Uh, but I think that, um, that generally speaking, these 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 big big themes of of power, um, revenge, um, manipulation are things that that we still experience um, a lot today, um, and that's why they're being brought up and connected to that I think is that they do also just offer such amazing roles to play and there's been a lot of kind of pretty great casting that's been going on um, in these shows and um, I saw for example Juliette Binoche playing Antigone um, up in Edinburgh at the International Festival so there's, there is a there is a 
you know, there are a lot of people, great actors, that that want to play these parts because they are sort of so extraordinary. But connected to what Jack was saying, I think that um, I think one of the one of the the worries that people have um, is is this fear of 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 how alien it is. I think that people worry that it's just very very different, and that it, I think it goes back to this sort of austere kind of you know white lines, sort of you know bare marble. That's what the classics are, all very dusty. Um, when in fact, I think that one of the sort of the joyful things about tackling tragedy nowadays, in a way, is that we should feel completely uninhibited by, by in a way, the if if it works, by the form that they had, because we can't recreate the the setting in which they were first performed. We can't end up performing them in front of thousands of people who know the myths, who know the illusions, and who understand the format and are familiar with this we can't do that so actually that gives us a great opportunity to to reinvent them for ourselves um, and I think that an education program that goes alongside any theatre production is always incredibly valuable because anything that can allow people to understand the themes of the play and the form of the play is a wonderful thing be it um, be it a Greek tragedy or, or be it you know, Ibsen or Shakespeare or whatever it might be, or, or a modern play indeed. Um, but uh, I think that with with tragedy or, or comedy, although you don't don't get to see a lot of comedy <laughs> around, um, but with tragedy, we actually have a, a great opportunity to, for example, really play with the chorus and find new and exciting ways um, to to tackle that. One of the um, one of the shows that I performed in as a student, actually, if I can just talk about that, and which again was a sort of a big inspiration and, and help for me going forward, was um, a production in ancient Greek of Medea. Um, and uh, the, the design concept was absolutely amazing. It was directed by an incredible um, guy called Nathaniel Coleman, who's just, just a it's a brilliant visionary guy, and he and, and his team who he was working with had this idea that all of the protagonists <clears throat> would be dressed as if they'd stepped off Greek vases, as it were. So we were all sort of, um, it was great, it made me look like I had a six pack, basically. Um, <laughs> so I was, yeah, great. Um, and uh, and uh, and that's how that was, and that was, that was great, and we all, and obviously we all speak in Greek. And then um, the, the chorus, though, started off in the audience and not in costume like that. They were sort of just, they were dressed um, all, all in black in a sort of unified way, but not in a uniform way. Um, and they started off in the chorus, it, sorry, in the audience, in the auditorium, spread out, sort of, sort of all around. Uh, and so that first line from the chorus in Medea, when they said, I heard a voice, I heard a voice. <clears throat> All of a sudden, as the audience had kind of sat down and was watching this 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 play unfold in Greek, all of a sudden people right next to them and all around them were saying, "I heard a voice, I heard a voice," and they all ended up sort of coming up onto the stage. And then as soon as they crossed onto the stage, they just went straight into into speaking in Greek instead. Um, and it was a really really powerful, wonderful way I I felt of connecting the audience to what was going on, that these people had, had really come out um, of them and were then involved in the action of the play. And then similarly at the end came back out um, again and, and the final lines were delivered in English. But those were the only two bits that were in English, all the rest was in um, ancient Greek. And I think that um, the, the more that theatres kind of realise that, that that's what tragedy can be as well, it can be this amazing exciting, vibrant experience and not not something that is dusty and not something that's, that's a museum piece, then then hopefully then the more widely tragedy or, or comedy will be performed and, and received. And, and, and also one other thing, I do feel that, uh, and I think it's happening more actually, which which is kind of exciting, that, that we can probably be a little bit freer sometimes in in our translations, particularly 
as we find in, in choral passages. There's a lot of allusion that's going on to, at times, sort of reasonably obscure um, mythical references. Um, <clears throat> and I think that in terms of really kind of drawing people in and taking them to that world, I, I just feel it's, pers I mean, this is personal opinion, but I just feel it's fine to cut that or to mm -hmm. change it to mm -hmm. something that people do know or to sort of to, to sort of slightly um, reduce the pool of that we draw references from so that we build up an understanding of those references through the play so that we can still achieve that sense of alluding to something beyond just the action but that we're not constantly sort of having people scrap into the program to look for you know, to, uh, who's Naomi? what's going on right. trying um, not to alienate trying not to alienate the audience because I mean as you noted earlier <clears throat> you know, an ancient audience would have been completely immersed in this mytho poetic system and they would have known all the illusions they would have known That's multiple it. versions of every myth so so I, I can see that for a modern performer and and writer that that's a real challenge to navigate that within our culture where people maybe a hundred years ago would have known these myths but maybe not now absolutely and I think it and I think in a way it's it's serving the intention of the of the writer more um, it's something I I mean if I can make a comparison there with Shakespeare as well but um, <clears throat> perform quite a lot in Shakespeare mm -hmm. and um, particularly in, in the comedies Shakespeare there are some things that are based so there are some jokes that might be based on the pronunciation that was being used at the beginning of the 17th century in London mm -hmm. because those words now aren't being pronounced the same way they, I mean they just aren't funny and you see some productions which then tr that sort of faithfully keep them in and sort of try to make some sort of joke out of it, but which invariably isn't that successful, I think. Right. <clears throat> or, or, or you cut it, and actually then, this, hopefully by, this, by, by cutting it or changing it slightly, the same percentage of the play is funny as the author intended, but there's no way that he could predict the changes of 400 years, let alone two and a half thousand years. So right. we're just in that in that case serving the writer really, and that's kind of what what our job is. It's as you know, it's, it's entirely practical. How can we make the writer's work come to life and and live for an audience for the next hour or hour and a half? Right. And just to give some people more context, you um, you've mm. toured extensively in the U.S. with roles in Much Do About Nothing and A Midsummer's Night Dream mm -hmm. with actors from yes. the London stage, and you've also mm. just returned, I think, from Wyoming, right, where you were yes. directing Much Do About Nothing. Uh, I was, yes. Yeah. So I was, I was there at the University of Wyoming, uh, <clears throat> and had a, that was a wonderful experience. I've always, actually, and with actors on the stage, I must say this as well, um, that uh, we work, we, we tour around American uh, universities. Taking Shakespeare, five hander Shakespeare's, uh, doing the whole play, but just with five people um, and okay. playing all the parts. <clears throat> and running alongside it, we run workshops um, for all the students. And those are for potentially for business students, um, sort of helping them sort of deliver speeches better, um, or you know, working on their presentation skills, or it might be with English students and things like that. And it's such a wonderful, picking up on what Jack was saying, it's such a wonderful thing to have an education program alongside. A production like that. I think it's a really important outreach thing. Um, and I will just say as well, not to ingratiate myself, but um, that American students are great. Oh. They are they are so they are so keen to say yes to anything that you suggest to them in terms of an exercise and whatnot. And it's really it's a really lovely atmosphere to work in. I will <laughs> That's so awesome. So, so uh, yeah, so I do want to take comments from everyone, um, and, but I hope we continue to talk about this idea of outreach to sort of everyone, right, beyond mm. the idea of to business students and to your your friend who went on to be, uh, I'm sorry, a banker or a businessman, and right? Banker, yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. So, so Jack, please talk, and anyone else who has a comment, we want to we want to have a nice discussion. Uh, uh, well, Paul, that, that, those you gave gave me a lot of ideas about how to how to promote. Uh, Ancient tragedy. I, what uh, follow-up question would be? Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you do, do you think uh, production um, uh, translations of uh, the classics, uh, we, you know, with uh, practical suggestions about how to, um, you know, make a uh, producible 
modern version uh, would would be um, would be publishable maybe on the internet uh, as uh, uh, open source translations that, that uh, uh, you know would get, give suggestions about how say if you were uh, like with uh, Greek tra uh, comedy uh, I was thinking Plautus and Terence did the same thing in in uh, Latin uh, with Menander uh, they they I mean they translated the jokes to uh, to things that the, the the Romans would understand um, if uh, you know we had free translations that are free in both senses of, mm -hmm. of, um, of somehow noting this is what the original said but you know we you might suggest to the to the uh, dramaturge or whoever is responsible for you know what's actually going to be spoken on stage uh, you know other approaches you, you think so it has anything like that been done yet or um, uh, do you have some suggestions on um, I don't I don't know if that's been done actually I think it would I think it'd be a great idea um, and yeah, it'd be an amazing resource to have for people for people to have access to, because I think that <clears throat> um, it's amazing how quickly uh, translations can can age, um, and what might seem very fresh, sort of twenty, thirty years ago, maybe you already sort of you kind of want to to look at um, again. Yeah, I I don't know of any such resources, but. It would be great if there were. I believe, and I've not, I've not seen the production, but I believe that the Oris Dyer that's currently on um, in London, at the, at the, it's now at the Trafalgar Studios, and it was at the Almeida Theatre. I believe they've taken quite a lot, quite a few liberties within that in a in a sort of good way, um, <clears throat> and I'm sure that that text would be available somewhere. I don't know um, where exactly right now, but um, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure it would be, um, and I think sort of generally, sort of in terms of picking up on that, we uh, I worked with um, a director called Richard Twyman a few years ago on a similar project actually, where we we looked, we sort of matched up the Oristia really. We we actually we did Iphigenia, Aulis, Agamemnon, and Electra um, together, um, and and radically reworked that and and did it so that each one was 45 minutes long um, <clears throat> and each one ha happening over the they all happened on the course of one night but happened in different um, each in a different space mm. um, um, to create these uh, different worlds and we we then we then kind of created a chorus which went all the way uh, well we sort of had two choruses a male and a female chorus the female chorus lasted all the way through and the male chorus um, started off in Ifjadara Aulis as the troops who were going to be going over to, to fight. Uh, and then in Agamemnon, they, uh, they took the role of the, of the elders chorus, as it were, in, in the original text, but they became veterans who had been shipped back early because they'd been injured. So they were sort of a bunch of um, veterans who, who sort of come back and were no longer um, <clears throat> kind of uh, sort of fully physically sort of um, able. Um, and then we had a, a female chorus that was that was mutable throughout, so that they became um, in Iphigenia Aulis. They were there very much sort of arriving um, with Iphigenia and Clytemnestra. And um, by the time they came in with Agamemnon, people introduced them there in the Agamemnon. And then they were the sort of the confidants of Electra in Electra. And then by the end, they then morphed into the Furies, and so we wanted to kind of have this idea that sort of the Furies had been present throughout. Um, and <clears throat> I think those, I mean, that's sort of an example, actually, actually, Sarah, um, if you wouldn't mind sort of um, going through the other four images um, that, that we um, had for that, you can just sort of see um, the different spaces that we had. Um, this was Clyde Messer turning up in the first, in if you are at it's actually sort of, it's actually at an army base, there are, there are crates lined up all the way across, and then the next one, um, shows uh, that's actually uh, Cassandra and you can see the the chorus of, of veterans behind uh, in uh, Agamemnon. This, that was then in 
in traverse, whereas the former one had been um, end on. And then the last two images are both from our Electra, which uh, this is, here's we had the farmer sort of very much on the outskirts of things. Actually, um, uh, he was farming dope and uh, he was sort of, sort of really on the fringe of things um, with Electra. And finally, we have Clytemnestra again at the tomb of uh, Agamemnon, which you can, unfortunately, you can see Agamemnon written with the wrong, I can't remember, there was, there was one letter wrong in it, <laughs> which, which is really frustrating. Or is the modern, it was, no, it was the modern one, anyway. Um, <clears throat> That's a beautiful image right there. I mean, you could see mm. sort of the power of translating um, sort of the visual art that is sort of embedded in the verbal art of ancient mm. tragedy. You really have a chance to really translate that, that, that visual art in new ways. Um, you know, I, I'd like to quickly just take a comment from, mm. um, from our Q&A, and, and Dan MC just is sort of cheering this on. He's saying, from my limited perspective with modern adaptations of Greek literature, I think a big problem is the failure of productions um, to make them appealing to the audience. We shouldn't just have actors dress in togas and recite a translation of the work. Mm. Yeah. Well, yes, I would. I would definitely, definitely. Echo. And and that's not to say as well that there isn't um, there isn't a, a place for for um, versions that are are set in in mythical times as well. It's um, um, I think I suppose that yeah, the thing I feel most passionately about with all of it is is it seems to me that it it works best. It all works best if we if we free ourselves though and really. Uh, come to everything with an entirely sort of fresh mind and a clean page that we go, we can, we can start again, we can make these ours and reinvent them in a way that speaks to us in the, in the clearest way. Okay, actually, can I throw a little wrench in this? So, I mean, what's so Please. interesting about this is that so much of our work together as a community is about reading these texts and, <clears throat> and reading, out, reading out of the text instead of reading into the text. So part mm -hmm. of our goal is to always um, sort of return to the text, see what's actually there, not insert our ideas in um, mm. as readers, right, when we're trying to understand this poetry as a system. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, we can understand how important it is to create these productions that really speak to us today, right? So mm. do, you see, do you see a need to have kind of both ways of interacting with these texts, um, with these works, or? Oh, I, I absolutely do, yes. I think that, um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that uh, level of sort of thorough approach right, is right. invaluable. And it's amazing, you know, in uh, even sort of my kind of like limited you know, studies in classics has, you know, has informed so much then of uh, right what I then do and I think what becomes interesting is as soon as it stops um, as soon as it stops being a text and becomes a script um, and then it, it becomes something that is entirely practical and it, the only question in a way becomes um, how do we make this work um, and I think that those then and what what solutions and sort of what uh, di hopefully dynamic and ex interesting solutions you can get out of that um, can lead you in all sorts of different directions. And I, the only thing I feel is that sometimes we feel a bit too um, mm -hmm. hidebound by our ideas of what it should be. And I think we should much more think about what it could be. Okay. Awesome. Do we have any other questions? Um, how, how do we... Looks like Jack had a question. I think Sarah had a comment before, too. Um, yes, yeah, Sarah again. Um, so, yes, you, you were mentioning um, the production of Oristea that was at the Almeida, which was another production that I saw. Um, and I think um, they, they took, as far as I could see, they took various versions of the myths. And one of the other things that we've been talking about in this um, community has been the multiformity of the myths um, and how originally it was an oral tradition and you know even the the plays that were produced they were uh, producing different versions of those same stories um, so 
perhaps this is it, it's getting that balance as, as Claudia was saying between what's there and bringing it in um, and, and 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 working with it in a way it it is a sort of multiformity for a modern audience if you are aware of what what is there in the original which clearly you are so that that's more of a comment than a question anyway yeah. it's it's where it, if I can sort of pick up on that one of the things I really enjoy um, very often uh, when people come to see Unmythable someone might come up to us at the end and say um, oh actually um, that couldn't have happened because this person was there by the time this person, you know, whatever it was, whatever it might be exactly. Um, and I really, I really love that response in a way because it, it totally appeals to sort of the, the stickler within me. But at the same time, um, our response is always this. I mean, they are live stories and okay. we've taken them and got a slightly different route. And, and I think, um, as you know, so when you're younger, when you're kind of growing up, you kind of feel there's one version of them, and that's what you should. You know, that's what happened. That's what happened. That's what happened. And actually, it's so liberating then to find out that there are lots of different versions of them. And actually, you could you could sort of just do some great cherry picking um, of whatever suits your needs best um, at the time. Right, when creative performance. And yet, I mean, and that I return to that beautiful story that you shared at the very beginning when we first began our discussion about you and your friends sort of being so moved by the original Greek too, right? So it's mm. not that these that these works in, in their original form are not engaging. Um, I think it's a matter of us learning how to help people it will bring it bring it bring it to them as you were saying, right? Help help more people have that experience. Absolutely, and I think that uh, you know I'm really keen for people to experience the classics in in as many ways as possible. And of course, for a lot of people, that might just be kind of you know seeing a couple of shows or or whatnot. And that that in itself is great. But um, <clears throat> you know, organisations like Classics for All that's now working um, in the UK, trying to increase people's access to you know being able to learn Latin or or ancient Greek, of course, is is absolutely brilliant and I think in the bottom, and it's and is essential as well really because if we want you know this 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 subject that we all feel so passionately about I mean if we want it to to carry on then you know we need to keep on fostering that love that that people have um, right. and I think it, it's sort of it, <clears throat> sort of I suppose that's slightly connected to that is because one of the other things I, I find very um, beautiful about classics in particular is that not only does it link us to two and a half thousand years ago or, or further um, back, um, but also it, it sort of links us to everyone who's coming between as well. Um, and even though you know, I'm, you know, you might kind of go, oh, I don't like the Victorians' approach to this, whatever. But actually, then sort of we've all we've all seen the world a bit through that filter. Um, and you know, inevitably, you know, like Shelley was saying, like we're all we're all Greeks. Um, but there's a, you know, for example, there's a great uh, poem by Patrick Shaw Stewart, um, standing in the trench Achilles, about when he's fighting in the First World War and waiting to go over to Gallipoli. <clears throat> and there's something so beautiful about the fact that a young person at that time, in 19, I think, 1917, is it, um, who was, you know, who would turn to Achilles in the way in, to sort of express how he felt about about impending death, um, and and there's sort of and that's sort of a, a wonderful kind of link for us to then and then through there to now. Like we're all sort of just links in a chain that goes all the way back. Well, I think that's a beautiful metaphor to to end on. It's twelve or three, so um, I do just want to thank everyone for joining us. Paul, thank you for joining us. We'd love to hear about your story. Uh, oh, about you. your experience in producing these amazing works. Uh, I hope everyone can have a chance to see Unmythable. Uh, you also have another performance based on Norse myths called Norse Men, right? Uh, Norsem, yes. Oh, Norsem, sorry. Norsem. Norsem. Yes, that's right. Um, so, you know, we look forward to, uh, to further conversations with you. Um, one thing you did have a chance to do is every once in a while um, we do have community readings of plays. Uh, and our most re recent was was Medea, um, and you had a chance to join us for that. That was a real inspiration. So we thank you for that again as well. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed it, and and thank you for having me here today. 
Yeah, it's a great pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Jack, Helen, Janet, Sarah, Bill, Zoe. Uh, we really enjoy you. Thank you to all our viewers who have been watching and to the community members who contributed comments and questions on the q and I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all today, but uh, we hope you join us again next time. See you soon.